outside of P3 to provide our full services. And that means a change is required in procurement models, and we're working on that as well. But the market is receptive to this. This slide here shows you know, we have been leaders in, in green buildings for many years. As I mentioned, I've been here for three years, and before my, my term at, uh, started at Ellis Dawn, I was talking to the executives, just brainstorming what the next generation of sustainability is going to look like. And they, they brought me in, I knew some of the executives for quite a while. Um, I was the CEO for the World Green Building Council for many years. But prior to that, um, working with Richard here and others to, to establish the Canada Green Building Council uh, here in Canada. But also a member of the United Nations, as well as at World GBC. And really seeing that international leadership and trying to figure a way to bring that to Canada. Um, a lot of big companies I was advising, like Magna, one of the biggest auto, automotive parts manufacturing companies. Uh, Ambridge Gas, who was by design program. And now with Ellis Dawn. So we're seeing that the shift of big business, big companies, really trying to find a stake in low carbon economics. One of the things that I really saw, bringing down the three key things that becomes issues for us, to me, it really is resource management. It's, it's energy demand, obviously, but now it's the emissions and byproducts. Those three things together really help to drive what we're trying to do in creating a resilient city strategy and a framework moving forward. With my term at the, the UN, these are some numbers that are very real. You know, we've heard these numbers we're moving to about 9 to 10 billion people by 2050. You know, right now, there are about 28 megacities on this planet, so that population of 10 million people. We're moving to 50 megacities. We're urbanizing very quickly, 70% of us living in urban centers. So those three points that I mentioned, where are the resources going to come from to build these cities? The energy, what's the source of energy? Is it fossil fuel or renewables? We have to look at all these options, and we start, have to start talking about things like life cycle assessment for buildings and materials. So we look at the marketplace, and even after all the work that we have to do, our commitments to the Paris Accord, you know, these numbers are still very low. We're trying to get an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050, and buildings, you know, with the success of BREM in, in, in Europe and LEED in, in Canada and the U.S., only 18% of the market can be classified as a green building. And transportation energy is not too far off that, so we've got a long way to go. I mentioned that 80% number, but this is what we agreed to in the Paris Accord. To reduce emissions by 80% from 1990 levels. Talking to people that I know across the sector, people are saying this is like every single building in this country being lead platinum. Is this realistic? Can we do that? I don't know, but we have to try and figure something out. For me, the difference is around how the term sustainability is being redefined. And it really is, from 10 years ago, the idea of the triple bottom line was an academic exercise and now it's becoming much more mainstream and much more in uh, uh, private sector you're looking at you know innovation carbon technology people planet profit low carbon economics when you talk finance that's when you start getting change happening right when that becomes part of the discussion this picture here was taken of all of the uh, political leaders getting together once they've signed the Paris Accord great picture my concern is when you look at a picture like this Governments do one thing, they set policy and regulations. But unless you get response mechanisms that meet those, you're still not going to get change. But then you have great nonprofit organizations and NGOs like the World Green Building Council, the US, Canada, you have great organizations that are trying to do everything they can. Uh, but then that responsibility is around education and advocacy. Again, does that tip a market? No. What we need is the big business players, the people that actually put the infrastructure in the ground. And unless you get big business agreeing to some of this stuff, this is still going to drag on. But the good news is, this picture for me is not what the, the visual shows. To me, it shows that the political leaders were able to get together because they believe the market is already changing. They had the confidence to know that by signing the Paris Accord, they're not going to cause a pickup in the marketplace because we've already had a crash already once uh, a few years ago, we don't need another. But these numbers are real. You look at the Bank of England, our fantastic Canadian Mark Carney is now the head of the Bank of England. I love that. <laughs> and the numbers that he's talking about investments into clean technologies in the trillions. Even with the problems in the US, the, the private sector is moving towards investments in clean technology and not backing off. Saudi Arabia is developing the world's largest mega fund at two trillion dollars specifically to get the dependence off of oil into innovation. 
So this is all real. The World Bank, this is a year, almost $30 billion just in climate change ad adaptation programs. Right? In Canada, we've had a big shift over the past uh, number of years. We've got a new government. We've got money going into climate change. We've got uh, cities like City of Toronto going for zero emissions buildings by 2030. Salem, Vancouver, but they're committing to be 100% renewables by 2050. An entire city the size of Vancouver. That's amazing. I sit on council at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. This is an agency where all We need to start watching that trickle-down effect as it comes to us, as we need to design and build this, this infrastructure. What does it mean to Ellis Gone? And again, you can ask that question, what does that mean to Stantec? What does that mean to other members? Uh, you know, we need to find out really where our place is in this, this world. I talk, thought, started talking a little bit at the beginning around Ellis Gone, but one of the things that we have as a strategy is what we're calling our cradle-to-grave services. And this is really that P3 model where we're working through all the different uh, areas. Um, we're trying to make sure that our different divisions that we have in place not only can work independently, but work very well together for that full suite of services to clients. For us, it's becoming the next generation of what Elston means to the marketplace. And that's becoming the most technologically advanced full services company in Canada. No longer is a construction firm. That's just our bread and butter. Right? And I think that's an important change. What the... Uh, what else God asked me to do is figure out what is our next strategy? How do we lead in sustainability? When you have a company like Ellis Dawn, it, it's usually a reactionary company, right? You, you have a client who wants a, a product. You have engineers and architects designing something. We take all that and we build it. We respond. We, we react. But where do we lead the market? That's what we're looking for. So sustainability offers us an opportunity to lead a market. What I did was I brought 75 executives together over, um, you know, in one day workshop, uh, we did this with the province of Ontario, and we started talking about what the different strategies can look like. Where I see the value is really that cross-sector opportunity. It's not any one company. If we come up with a plan or a strategy, and it's only our company, well, that's just like a CSR strategy that sits on the shelf somewhere. I want to make sure we're permeating that market. I think we have to partner with the right kind of companies. So the, the logos you see on the right, uh, on the left, sorry, were the first ones to come in and we're adding to, to the membership on a regular basis. It's looking at what does low carbon economics mean, like I said at the beginning. So we've established something called the Carbon Impact Initiative. This is our action plan. And like I said, you have government setting regulations and NGOs doing, doing education and advocacy, but you've got to make sure that the actions, that things are getting built on the ground. So our action plan is, is very simple. We published this thing uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, this is available online. There will be a website you can download it from later on. But it's four key things. It's pilot projects. Hitting net zero energy, carbon neutral, carbon positive, whatever it is, is that level of what I'm calling hyper-efficiency that we need to hit. It's accounting for the carbon during all life cycle processes of a project, whether it's a bridge, whether it's an airport, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a school, it doesn't matter. What we're not doing right now is tracking emissions during construction. If you're building a hospital for three years, that's a lot of trucks coming and going. That's a lot of embodied material energy. We have to account for all that, and no one is doing that. We've been looking everywhere for tools that do it, so we haven't found that, and I'll tell you what our response is in a few minutes. We need to test and verify technologies. That's actually item number three. If you have a client who's going to own a project for 30, 50, 80 years, they're going to be a little apprehensive on testing a new technology they haven't heard of before. I think it's our responsibility as big companies to give confidence to these technologies. That's part of what we're trying to do. And finally, number four, this is the private sector. We've got to give return on investment to the people involved in the projects, whatever that might look like. We can't just do it because we love the planet. We'd love to. But we have to find out what the response and that return looks like for everybody. So we go through a few of these things. And for us, you know, this is action item number one is that promise of net zero, whether it's energy, emissions, or others. We have to realize no one in this country, anyways, really gets this properly. We haven't built too many of these. Even Stantec is doing quite a few. It's still fairly early stages in this country for this kind of stuff. But we're trying to figure out that opportunity against the return on investment versus the projects we're working on. And you see these kind of numbers from Pike's research. You know, this market is moving fairly quickly. 
I think now's the time to, to figure out how to get involved. Um, one of the projects that we started off with is Mohawk College uh, Net Zero Energy. We've just finished putting the solar panels on this. Doors will open in a few months. Um, this was quite an undertaking. This is the very first Net Zero project Elston has built. Um, we got very nervous going into it, but we're now ready to publish a lessons learned report. Uh, there was engineers and architects designing this building, but we figured out during construction there's a lot of number of red flags coming up. We're saying, we don't know if we're going to meet our targets. But luckily, everybody came together collaboratively and sorted everything out, and now we're on track. And it's that collaborative, uh, um, integrated design mentality that allowed us to reach our goals with this college. So we're looking forward to publishing that report uh, in a month or so. This one here is very exciting as well. Uh, the Evergreen Brickworks is, um, for those of you uh, online who don't know, is a fairly high-profile project outside of Toronto. Uh, traditionally, from the 1800s, all the bricks that built the city of Toronto were, were baked at the, the Brickworks Centre. It's now, it's obviously been closed, been retrofitted. It's now a, a grassroots organization that focuses on sustainability. There's a farmer's market there, families come and go. It's a really nice site. Um, they have a new initiative to create the actual very large space, the Kiln Barnes uh, building or facility. They're retrofitting that to carbon neutral. And again, it's the first one for us. Carbon neutral is totally different than net zero energy. It's a whole different animal. So we are tracking, and Natasha's here in the office with me, in the audience, she's, she's managing this whole project, and it's Excel spreadsheets. It's trucks coming and going. It's, it's everything involved, right? And so that's very interesting for us to try and work with, um, with Evergreen in that initiative. Um, one of the things that became very clear to us when we're talking climate change, I talked earlier about getting outside of sectors, getting cross-collaboration going. And we work very well in our little niches, right? We're building and designing buildings. But you know that 51% of climate change is as a result of agriculture. It's not buildings, right? So how are we tackling that? That's part of our concern. These numbers are real. This is not just the cow in the field stuff. This is the process, this is the shipping. This is everything involved with food production. And we have to figure out how to manage this. Because we don't know. No one's tackling this. Is there an opportunity for cross-sector collaboration? We think so. Uh, one of the new projects that we have just been uh, greenlit is Canada's first aquaponic hydroponic vertical farm at 200,000 square feet. I can't tell you the, the client yet, but it's an academic institution partnering with, uh, with industry to make this happen. So we're talking about creating a center uh, that is looking at the market research around all of this, the hub of innovation around urban food and agriculture. Dixon de Pommier from Columbia University began talking about this a number of years ago, the idea of creating these pods where you sell the food at the market square every eight blocks of an urban core. You've got, uh, you know, this is not new stuff. This is Machu Picchu in, 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 uh, in Peru. It looks very much like this design for, right, urban food, vertical farm. So it's just adding new technologies. This is a design that was proposed for Las Vegas, integrating buildings, renewable energy, and plant growth. You look at some of the competitions happening around the, the world, Singapore. You look at this one here from Perkins and Will uh, for London in, in England. Right? So the, the movement towards vertical farming is real. I don't know if I put cows on a building, <laughs> but the idea is good, right? At least leadership is there. For us, what we're looking for is the leading edge example so that what we're involved in is not too early. We're not bleeding edge, so it doesn't make sense to the market yet. This is happening. This is the uh, World Food Building going up in Sweden. The idea of this building is you have multi-stories on the south side that grows the plants and use AI and robotics for harvesting. On the north side of the building is office space. So what happens now is a very green building where the, the tenants give off CO2, the plants give off oxygen, it exchanges. But they're also harvesting. There's a restaurant at the bottom distributing the food to the community. It becomes an opportunity. This is our project. What we're looking for is a building that is net zero energy, carbon neutral, produces food, and tests new innovation and technologies so that we can start pushing the market around uh, vertical farm, urban agriculture in Canada as part of an international network that's developing. So this is just a, a concept sketch. We're doing our first workshop at the end of April on this, inviting people from across sectors to talk about how this building's gonna look. But this picture here, you see solar panels on, on 
trying to generate enough energy. You've got the idea from sketches here where you have shipping, receiving, you have a conference center and restaurants. You have different levels of testing the different technologies for growing plants indoors in controlled areas. Imagine if we come up with a solution for growing plants in more hostile environments like Canada's north. Can you then take that technology and go up to uh, First Nations communities to help grow plants on local scale? So these are the things we're thinking about this project, but it's buildings, it's architects, it's engineers, working with farmers, right? Working with the communities to try and figure out those next steps. It becomes very exciting for us. We started talk, I started talking at the, uh, at the beginning a little bit around how do we start tracking the carbon emissions. Um, we realize with agriculture, buildings, transportation, industry, these are the big emitters. Trying to figure out solutions where we unify all of these becomes very important. We look at the amount of cement and concrete and trains and trucks coming and going and projects that we're working on at the large scale for stadiums and hospitals. That's a lot of emissions. And we don't know what that looks like as far as a megaton number. We need to know that because now in Ontario we have a cap and trade program. Right? We all know this. Vancouver and Canada is pushing right across the country for a price on carbon. So that means we need to start accounting for this because we're going to start getting asked for those numbers. So we're developing a way through life cycle assessment to really determine the impact of what's happening in the marketplace. Again, this is one of Natasha's uh, projects. Uh, the details of this, I, it's even getting out of my brain now. And I'm relying on Natasha for the information uh, moving forward. But it's really looking at various scopes now and making sure that you know, direct emissions and activities is fairly easy. Number two is fairly easy, but when you're looking at emissions from embodied emissions and materials and tracking that, that's going to suppliers and manufacturers and asking, what did it take to make that product? Because we need to account for that. That's the embodied energy. And we have to track all of that. So the question becomes, how do we do that? This is the life cycle according to the European Committee of Standardization that we're following right now from A1 through to C4 and voluntary uh, level D. But we need to make sure that we're following this, especially for us, construction stage. Where is that information pulling it all together? So you know, we're looking at various issues right now from metering, monitoring construction materials. And even when it gets down to the demolition and deconstruction, we have to be ready for that. It's going to be a while before we're at this level, but we have to be ready to account for all these emissions. And what we're doing now is looking at ways to do that, and we're developing our own tool, a carbon accounting system that is software and app-based. What I wanted is to be able to go to a site, a hospital and a client, from design and track emissions through construction, and that stays with the client for operations. So they know real time the impact of their project on a given day. Now imagine you're going to need people that know the details uh, numbers, but the CEO or, or a, a chair of a board does not need to see all these spreadsheets. What he wants is a number on his phone, walks into board meeting, this is the impact of our portfolio. So our tool is going to bridge both of those things. You're going to have detailed numbers for governments, for funding, and whatever else you want to do, but we want to make sure that the client has that knowledge, has that power, has that ability to influence and impact their portfolio. So that's what our tool is doing. Um, there's a lot of tools out there, but nothing that is that full life cycle. We've, these are all, they're all things like at design stage or at this stage. They only do one thing. Nothing does the full life cycle. I couldn't believe it. So uh, what we've done is um, we've managed to get a $2 million grant from the federal government and the Center for Excellence to develop the research and back end of this tool. Um, University of Toronto was engaged with us. And we're, you know, the, the 1.6 came from them. The rest of it comes from us. And we're pulling all this information together. We're using the Evergreen Brickworks project that I showed you earlier as our case study for this. And we've identified two other projects, both a building and an infrastructure project. So we can look at the historical data to know what it is that we're not already chasing or quantifying. What are we missing in what we collect now through invoices? And that'll be the back end of our, of our work uh, for our tool. But you know, we need to make sure that we're really capturing all this information. Uh, from the database at the front end to finally how does it get outputted to the clients and, and others. We have the province and the Fed saying, can this tool be agnostic enough that levels of government can use it? We're saying, yeah, all we want to be able to do is you put in whatever the project is and just start tracking. We don't want to start saying, you must reduce now. No, I want to know what the number is. And when we know the number, then we can start saying, okay, for the next project or however we, we can move things around and start, as a, as a market, start moving our GHG impacts. So it's getting very exciting for us. And as I mentioned, we're doing it at Evergreen Brickworks. 
This is an example of what's driving Natasha crazy. It's the idea of all everything that we have to, to track from a mission standpoint. It's a lot of work, as you can imagine. So we're always looking for people to work with on these projects. Um, and I think in the next couple of years, it's going to be uh, very exciting working with people. Um, <laughs> next is really around materials and technologies. And, and one of the things that we're finding at Ellis Dawn, I mean, construction sector is not a fast-moving sector whatsoever. There's not a lot of innovation going on in construction. But we need to try and change that. And working with engineering firms like you guys and others, how do we get better at mass wood construction technology, CLT systems, right, cross laminated beams. We did the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario, we're very proud of that. We did the Surrey Memorial Hospital, you know, a lot of, lot of large uh, beams and wood frame structures. But we need to get better at that. And we've been traveling across the country to look at the manufacturers and how they create the different materials, the big span beams that we're, that we're going to install. What is the, the mechanism for, for manufacturing and engineering those? Can we bring that knowledge in-house to start prefab modular system at the commercial scale? We're talking about home builder level uh, and how they're doing the prefab modular stuff and how can we add that uh, at, the, at the commercial scale and things like that. We have the largest uh, BIM division or one of the largest BIM divisions in Canada. Can we utilize BIM technology to better plan, better account for carbon emissions, better work with the different new materials and systems? So this is getting very new and innovative uh, for us. One of the areas that we're getting into fairly quickly, we were almost forced to, is the idea of, of energy and, and digital services. This is the smart building work, right? intelligent buildings. And we, we found that we can't just leave that to outside firms because we're building a building to these new levels of efficiency. It's a very sophisticated product at the end. We have our own facilities management team in-house that can manage that project as it operates, but we need to have that smart building interface that needs to be ours. We need to know and track and be able to monitor everything. So our, our issues were identified very quickly. You know, it's around you know, the costs of energy. It's about the operating and, and CapEx costs. It's about the user demand obviously wants more when it comes to, uh, to, to internet of things and really working through the different systems. We want to make sure that we have a system right now in buildings where everything is separate. Nothing connects. Why is that? We have to have our HVAC systems and our communication systems, everything all working together. So what we've done is we've created a dashboard that unifies all of this. We can now go to companies like your Siemens, your Johnson Controls, your Honeywells, who really want their entire systems put into a building and they basically own that building. And you cannot get out of that technology. We're, we're going to them saying, look, you want to be on the next Ellis Dog project? We need you to open source your technology. So then we can add whatever we want within that building, everything connects to our dashboard, and everything talks and everything is unified. So we've been doing this on quite a few projects, and we're looking at ways to do it so that we really reduce that power load. That's power over Ethernet. It's not just hydropower or, or uh, off the grid, right? So for us, the benefits are really obviously about building performance, because if we're building and designing net zero energy, our performance needs to make sure we are delivering every year to the client you know, that zero for zero. We need to make sure that we're generating as much as we're using. We need to, we need to track that. Um, these are some of the projects we have our, our intelligent uh, dashboard in already. And uh, we have uh, clients now, like Oxford Properties and Cadillac Fairview and others, asking for our dashboard, asking for our services in, in what we're doing. So it's getting very exciting. And, and, and again, this is really about the smart community. It's not the standalone buildings anymore. Everything has to work together. The buildings, the cars are plugging into buildings. It, you know, we're working with various companies to say, how do we actually build a project where the internet is the first thing to consider? Let's build a building around that. So that idea of the, the cross-sector collaborative model with cities as the nucleus is so, so important now. It's a work that, similar to what I did about eight, nine years ago with the province of Ontario, when we were looking at electric vehicle infrastructure. When you have a car plugging into a house to get energy off of the grid, and you had a car manufacturer and a home builder and a utility have never had talked before. So we have to force those conversations and how things are moving. Right? With some of the things we can do from a from a civil division uh, for, for infrastructure, one of the things we've done successfully is all the on route stations along the 400 highway system in Ontario. Uh, we built all of those. And now we've just got a, a huge amount of money from the provincial government to electrify all of those for charging stations for for cars. And I believe they're going to be the DC fast charge systems, where you go in there, plug your car in for 30 minutes, go for a pee break and a hamburger, come out, your car's charged. So that's getting very exciting. When, you're, when you have a highway system as long as the 401 across Ontario, 
um, you know, that's bigger than, than the UK itself, right? So we need to figure out how to electrify all that, which is great. Um, I mentioned very quickly around uh, the work that we're trying to do, or I did before with the province. Sorry, go back for a minute. So here, uh, we're trying to add it to solar charging with canopies. But this is the report I did uh, for the province a number of years ago, and it really started getting a lot of traction. And I love how you see, you know, here's the idea, but now let's get to implementation. But it took, you know, five to eight years to get here. We've got to move faster than that. And I think that's why we need companies to say, let's just get on with this and figure it out. If you look at all the projects that we're doing across uh, Ontario, across Canada, when it comes to light rail transit systems and others, we need to take this leadership. We've got to talk more about this in the marketplace. And I think everybody on this call needs to figure out what their voice is in this area. We need to celebrate successes. If I'm just talking about the greatness of Ellis Dawn, that's me talking, it sounds like a sales pitch. But what if I'm up here saying, hey, you know the great work Stantec did with CDML? Well, someone else, oh, wow, he's talking about another company, must be good, take notes. We've got to figure out strategies to work together to collaborate and celebrate our successes. And I think that leadership has to be there. When I start, start talking about return on investment, it's also about where the leadership opportunities sit. And since we've launched our carbon impact initiative, you know, we've been able to do some pretty amazing things in the marketplace. So we look at some of the responses we've had so far. You know, we're working with Interior Centers for Excellence, look at new technologies in the market, working directly with, with the utilities in Ontario for exchange of, of uh, grants and bringing clients and, and grant makers together. You know, Waterfront Toronto in Canada, we've heard about the big initiative at Waterfront with Sidewalk Labs and Google. You know, I'm proud to say that we were one of the catalysts for that whole project. So Will Fleissig, the CEO, and, and our guys, we got together to help pull all that uh, together. That was a fascinating thing to go through. And now it's over a million square feet where Google is, is so integrated into that, and they want to create this community, live, work, play from the Internet up. That's a first for Canada. And it's a big, high-profile project. Colleges Ontario, all the colleges, 28 in Ontario, want to have a net zero energy building on every single campus so they can get that next generation of young professionals understanding what it means to, to operate but also work in these facilities. We're doing stuff right across the country with Alberta and BC. The federal government, NRC, is now working with us on our carbon accounting tool. They want to create that unified database that everyone across the country goes to for information on embodied energy, the cataloging of different materials. If that's standardized, we're on to something. And finally, you know, we're very fortunate to be invited by the World Bank's Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, one of 40 companies invited to help put a price on carbon. So we're very close to an international price on carbon. It becomes a commodity like oil and natural gas. When that happens, that's a game changer. And being asked to be a part of that process has been, has been very exciting in the work that we're doing. Um, I talked a little bit about Waterfront Toronto, but you know what? There's so much happening here on the waterfront. The, the, the push, all three levels of government are working hard to figure out how to do this. Um, we're already working on the Donlands area and, and the work that we're doing around there. We've got uh, George Brown College here as well, a couple of projects that we're working and supporting. And it's just great having you know, the senior executives of, of multiple companies supporting Waterfront Toronto and what this can actually come become for, for Ontario and for Canada. Um, this is a project outside of London, getting awards. We're uh, a general contractor in a few of the major projects here. This is going to be Ontario's first net zero energy community. So this is homes, this is condos, this is office buildings infrastructure, all being net zero energy. So that's very exciting as well. And again, again just to finish off, you know, the leadership play is so important. It's always making sure that we are positive, looking for the right opportunities. And for me, the work that we did with Mohawk, that lessons learned report I, I told you about that we're gonna publish, how do we then build on that? How, how do we then take the knowledge of people at various points of development or project like construction or facilities management and bring everybody together at the beginning of a project to consult and say, if you're going for this target, let's work together to bring price points down, technologies are right sized, and it's done on time, on budget. You cannot do it in a linear fashion anymore. Procurement models have to change to make this happen. And I think we can all do that together very effectively. So we're trying to figure out a way, how do we take our leadership in the projects we've done across the country and internationally and be a bit of an early stage consultant in the work. So that's what we're looking to do right now.
this come along well. That's the website for our uh, Carbon Impact Initiative report. So uh, enjoy that. And if there's any questions, my voice is a bit harsh, so let me know. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you, Andrew. That was uh, as interesting and entertaining and informative as ever. And uh, you've obviously been busy over the three or four years that, uh, since I've seen you just a little bit. Well. I'd like to open up the floor. Has anybody any questions in the room, or has anybody got any questions online? I'm behind you, David. Unfortunately, I have multiple questions. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I can answer them. First yeah. of all, Sibsi, who is the sponsor of this, and we are co sponsoring it through ASHRAE, you did not mention either one of us as technical societies. They're all volunteer driven. Yeah. ASHRAE has 57,000 members in 130 different countries. Well, let's be honest with you. Wonderful work, but it's pretty local. All I, we need to do is have people like you come to us and look at what we do and see if we can work together. Yeah. And that has never happened, to my knowledge. And that's what actually one of the reasons why I'm here. Because I think, you know, we have a company that is fairly large in Canada. We have offices in Dubai and doing very well there. We're doing stuff in uh, South America, building two of the largest office towers in Colombia. We're doing energy projects, starting two in the U.S. But outside of Canada, it's very new. Uh, we need to make sure we are talking to organizations like you guys so that you understand where we're coming from. We look at the resource that you have, and then how do we, from this point forward, figure out a way to start working together. So when David said, Andrew, would you come and do this? I'm like, yes, like that. Because I need to figure out, if I went to every single member, I, I'd be retired by the time I made any impact. But doing something like this where I get all the membership watching and then emails or calls start coming in, well, then we've got something, right? That's that collaborative model that I'm trying to stimulate. I'm doing it with the, uh, the um, Construction Association, the, 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 um, the Carpenters Union. So Mike York had me down uh, in the U.S. presenting down there. We we're a union-driven company. So being able to go to the unions, organizations like yours, the Home Builders Association, Build, we're working with them. But everybody, and I need to figure out the best way to get to everybody. And to me, this is the first step with you guys. Yep. Because we do another question. Go for it. Which is really not to do with Ashley directly. It's to do with my career. My career was spent dealing primarily with small buildings. Small buildings. Yeah, well under 50,000 square feet. Commercial scale? Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of them. Okay. And they've all got very inefficient rooftop systems on them, heating and cooling them. Yeah. How do, we, how do we get the developers that build those buildings to understand cost and the advantages? And I, you know, I tried desperately for years to get people to understand you're better off to build a central system that is going to give you an efficient system over the, over the life cycle of your building. It's going to cost you less maintenance, it's going to cost you less energy. And in actual fact, you're probably going to have a better comfort condition. And that community just will not listen. Yeah. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'd like to. You know, finish that off by a statement. This is given by a gentleman from, from France who is a, a board member of REVA, which is a big association in Europe that's in the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, another te technical group like Ashray and Simpson. Mm -hmm. And his comment was if you can't bring the boiler room to the boardroom, you'll never win. <laughs> Good, yeah. um, you know what, I, I really echo those comments because uh, not only the small under 50,000 square foot buildings, but it's existing towers. The City of Toronto is an example. It's such a hard time getting their tower renewal initiative moving. Um, we were just at a meeting a few weeks ago specifically on that with the new Chief Resiliency Officer for the City of Toronto. And he's asking everybody, how do we do that? They were talking about it from the, from the finance side, the, the owners, uh, the engineers. I said, but what about the trades? What about the people that are that are going to work with the buildings? What if, how, they, they don't know what it is they're working on. If they don't know the need for efficiency, again, that's another area we have to tip that as well. You know, one of the things we've done at Ellis Don is we've set up a special projects division specifically for projects under 50,000 square feet because we're, we're getting a lot of requests to do just that, to make it more efficient, better with the older building stock. How do we start retrofitting? Ellis Don has not been uh, traditionally a retrofit type company. We build new, but now we're changing that. And our FM team, our facilities management team, is involved in that process. I think we need to look at small scale. We've got to look at towers. Anything that's over 20 years old, we need to start looking at how to address that because that's a bulk of what the city of Toronto is, Calgary. Calgary, you know, they, you know the push there is not new. It's retrofit. 
So our carbon impact initiative program is not focused on new, it's how do we retrofit to zero emissions? How do we look at hyper efficiency in existing infrastructure? <coughs> I'm, I'm with you on that question, I think, but I think we're starting to get at least ourselves educated on what that means and what the opportunities are. And again, reaching out to the right kind of people that can physically make that change happen is so important. In, in those, that list of four things you looked at, uh, yeah. measurement and verification is absolutely essential yeah. in any integrated design as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And the final piece of that is making sure that the operational staff understands what the designer was using. Yeah. And I, I, I spent most of my life doing commission work long mm -hmm. before that work was actually in the industry. Yeah. But in my mind, I have a very simple definition of commissioning. It's transferring the engineer's knowledge to the operator's hands. And if you don't do that, your building will never work properly. Yeah, yeah I agree. And that's, again, that's why we're developing our tool. The tool has to be there to provide that knowledge to the client and the operators. When we're, if whatever stage it is, if we're building something, we need to make sure that the people on site understand what it is they're building. And they have to understand the importance of tracking information through the tool. When it gets down to operations, your energy, your emissions has to be tracked. So you have that, you know, basically knowledge is power, right? When you have that information, you know what to do with it. And everything that Dave has been doing through CDML and the converged technology that he's got, the stuff that we're doing with our tool, I can see that. <laughs> all good questions. I did all Okay, I'll throw in the window. I'm here today from Canada Design. Kind of piggybacking on the question that were asked. I want to maybe put a spin on it, and then I like the fact to use the board's uh, tipping point. Because <laughs> yeah. we all talk about these initiatives, and I'll specifically like carbon tax you mentioned. Yeah. And we know, you know, the momentum is building, and we know it's coming with timing. Obviously, it's essential here. I guess my specific question is. Where do you think the enforcement comes from? You know, as an industry, AC industry, we're so used to like code-driven sort of yeah. solutions and you know approaches. The codes are not there, right? Yeah. Where do you see the actual action happen to enforce some of these ideas? So, I, yeah, I mean, to me, it depends on if you're asking it from an international question, uh, a national question, a local question, right? And I think internationally, that's already happening. You're seeing leadership in Europe where you have labels on buildings where at point of sale, you're comparing buildings one to the other and say, I'm going to buy this one because it's more energy efficient, it's better on water and better than everything else. We're not doing that here. But it's now moving because now the province has started asking that everybody owning buildings must start declaring their energy and water use. They're not making that public yet, but they're asking for that information. The next step will, I think, be potential for that labeling type of system. We're also looking at everything that's happening with our cap trade work, uh, you know, with carbon emissions, because now we're starting to give information to the province on what we're emitting. Universities, large campuses, you know, they have to be accountable for the emissions they give off. Cement Association, right, they're worried, not worried, not worried they're working towards how do they start looking at material manufacturing, steel, gypsum, glass, they're all being hit right now with, with that carbon tax through cap and trade. That's going to start tipping to that information share and knowledge. When we get that happening, you see we're going to start moving very quickly to what Europe and some parts of Asia Pacific are already doing. When I was with the World Green Building Council, we set up a program for carbon tracking through C40 nations, uh, cities, right? So looking at how we, how we tap into that from a Canadian perspective, not just provincial. I think we have great leadership in Ontario that's trying to figure it out. Yeah, there's hiccups along the way. It's a lot of work. BC is working on it, Alberta is now working on it. And there's some great leadership happening across the country, but it is a bit of a wild west out there still. It's a bit of growing pains. And again, I think the opportunity to take that leadership from big companies to offer that anchor is gonna be so crucial moving forward because when the government starts to regulate, they've been at us already. We've been to many meetings. Yesterday, with, we were with- I was gonna say MOI. Yeah, we were with the Ministry of Infrastructure yesterday and Infrastructure Ontario. We were there in the room with all of them, they're asking us, they want to start putting their procurement requirements uh, on LCA, right? And how do we start providing uh, the carbon accounting for that protocol early stage in procurement? So they're asking us, can we can we do that? I say, not only can we do it, we're leading in the markets. The question shouldn't be, can all of do it? Can our competitors do it? And that starts to move that market. So again, everything is bubbling right. We're not there yet, but it's, like I said earlier, it's that hockey stick. We're, we're jumping up real quick. 
excuse me, in terms of constructability of some of these new and innovative approaches, they're, they're not uh, any uh, innovative uh, yet, but uh, let's say now, but 20 years ago, dynamic installation that you, uh, I've seen NRCAN and also University of Toronto is supporting some of these uh, grants to uh, your company, I yeah. guess, with your projects that they initiated uh, the idea of dynamic buffer zone, dynamic insulation, when you can use it for the retrofit of existing buildings, when you can basically capture some of the conduction heat loss through the exterior uh, of the buildings. And that is exactly uh, meets your requirements for uh, approaching to net zero energy or carbon neutral. But um, I'm wondering, uh, for the past 18 years, when I was just working in the construction industry, I've been trying to um, basically um, get some uh, developers or perhaps some uh, people who are a construction company to buy into using these innovative approaches when they are retrofitting the existing buildings. For the most part, nobody is interested in uh, utilizing these uh, approaches. Yeah. They are very uh, cost effective. It's been proven uh, by the University of Toronto. It's been uh, proven out there uh, in uh, the, uh, let's say, the um, manufacturing of the building material is using it. But I'm wondering why there are so many resistance in terms of the uh, construction companies to use these approaches for the retrofitting of existing buildings. Yeah. Have you ever looked at those? <laughs> You know, you, you wonder that, you wonder that, and I wonder, I wonder that too. Uh, and that's why I'm here. Because for me, coming into Ellis Dawn, I don't want to just go into a company where they've already changed the way they do things, because then I'm just part of a cog of a wheel. By getting into Ellis Dawn and offering them a new way of doing things, a new insight to educate internally and giving them confidence that change doesn't mean pause, that's been a big difference. So you ask that question, I ask the same question. So I feel my role is to go into a company like Ellis Dawn and show them the, that we can do this kind of stuff. It's not, uh, it's not fancy sci-fi technology. No, it's, not. it's off the shelf, just put together in a better package. It's a system. One of the things that we're concerned about is a perfect example where I was talking to uh, the architect at Mohawk, and one of the projects he's working on is going for uh, another one, going for net zero energy. And the trades weren't aware of, or didn't put the importance of the target. And they were just, you know, and all of a sudden they had a leak in a wall and like, what's going on? And apparently the guy said, oh, no one's going to find out about that. And they just put the drips up and they walked away. <laughs> and they found the leak in the wall. And then they went to the, well, what, is, what are you guys doing? And they said, well, it doesn't matter. It does matter. But if you don't educate the trades, if you don't educate everybody along that process, you're going to have problems. So for it's me, it's a big money. Yeah, I just want to add that it's it's not even up to us. It's up to the client. We can only build what they will let us build, and it's up to, to them for the upward capital costs. Mm -hmm. So I think the change has to happen at the client level for them to understand that if they invest just a couple more percent in their money towards net zero energy, they're saving for life on the operational side. So, I mean, if it was up to me, I'd say we're not going to work with any other client if they don't want to do net zero or better. Like, give it up to me tomorrow, but no, we're not going to work with you. Give us a high sustainability target, then we'll be your builder. But we can't. Weapon, <laughs> well, but we can't, right? We have to, if they want a 1970s style horrible builder, we have to build it that way. Okay. So I think a part of it is, is us to educate the client, but also yes. for the, yes. right? So we have to do that, but it's also the client having to demand more from us. Because what is really important for the client is the return on investment of uh, those type of uh, innovations. So, uh, uh, what basically developers and the constructors can uh, try to help is to just um, put their numbers in, yes. in, in with respect to how much energy you will be saving if you are approaching this mm -hmm. method, or how much. Uh, basically how much how much money you would be saving, let's say ten years from now. You know, if you're not uh, looking at uh, one initial cost, which may be very high at the beginning, but then if you just look at the trend, the life cycle uh, analysis, let's say for ten years from now, then you may uh, win. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I have another question. I'm just the life cycle. Got a question on? We got all the line question from, from London. Uh, Tim Dwyer, do you want to uh, jump in and ask a question? Uh, 
Andrew, thanks for that excellent presentation. Uh, I was very pleased to, to hear you say that uh, refurbishment and, and retrofit were important parts of the, uh, the whole picture uh, when you answered that previous question. I just wondered whether the uh, focus on individual buildings was perhaps uh, missing the, the need to look at future cities or the whole uh, smart city concept and whether by, by concentration on iconic buildings such as the fantastic ones you showed in your presentation we may actually miss the wood for, for the trees. Uh, what, what do you think on that? Yeah, I, I agree with you to some extent. Um, although some of the efforts that I've been involved in the past couple of years, um, especially in the Canadian marketplace, is is demonstrating by action. And I think what we're struggling with is, you know, I think what happens in Europe, where the whole smart city concept is is really embraced, and there's a lot of great work happening, especially at the municipal level across Europe. Um, in Canada, it's it's still a little bit of of caution. And I think the way we get past that is to effectively demonstrate through the kind of projects that have big public profile, like your hospitals, your airports, places where people come and go on a regular basis. They see the impact and the benefit of living, working, and playing in these advanced, hyper-efficient projects. They start asking for that in homes. They start asking for that in their next project. A point of sale. So I really believe in Canada we have we have great intentions and we're happy, friendly people. But we're 20 years behind what happens in Europe, and I think that that's where my caution is: is how do we get the the right leaders feeling like they have an industry within this country that gets it, and if they start asking for smart city infrastructure, they start asking for net zero energy or, or zero emission buildings, that they're not going to get dramatic pushback, especially at point of election turnover, which is happening here very soon. So we have to make sure that we can work together both from government and industry so that collectively we have the right tools to demonstrate and then collectively we look for the larger scale build out at the smart city level, which I totally agree with if that makes sense. No problem. Yeah. May I ask another question? Please. So in, ter in terms of uh, life cycle house, yeah. when you're in the commercial building world, when people do retrofits of existing structures, unless they're very, you know, very wealthy corporations, they have to get a mortgage. And most mortgages only last for commercial buildings for five years. So the very, very first question that they ask, will this pay me back in five years' time? And five years has always seems to be that that's that's yeah. that's always been that sweet spot. Um, one of the things where I think a big difference is it depends. You know, we can do different building types. I'm just give you one quick example. Um, you know, for example, we're doing Mohawk College to net zero energy. Net zero energy is not the solution to everything. In fact, it's only a few beacon projects that can effect, effectively do net zero energy. But you have something where when you are doing your analysis of your energy use, your life cycle for emissions. If you're generating energy on site, things like BRAM and LEED, green buildings, they're great, but you're not necessarily going to guarantee your payback right away. So a lot of it is really about market engagement and leadership wanting to do the right thing. But now we're at a point where when you're putting a price on carbon, when energy costs are soaring in this country like they have been doing in Europe, anything that, that reduces that operating cost now we're looking at the opportunity to, to, for example, if it's net zero energy, build a building where you're generating as much energy as you're using. So if you do it right, you're zero dollars at the end of the year. That starts paying back right away. Whether that's five years or, or three years or, or eight years, we still have to see how that looks. When it comes to zero emissions buildings, we still have to find out if you're going for a carbon neutral building, how long is your offset strategy so you're truly, from a, an operational standpoint, at zero, carbon zero. We don't know that answer yet. Right? So especially in our marketplace in Canada, this is so new, that's where we all have to figure out how to work on this together. But I think it's so much better than just a green building rating system, finally, because it's based on the finance and the energy. I think that's where we're on a tipping point, to your point, tipping point. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm going to my view. So you have punitive, you know, cut and dry carbon sanctions, that's your punitive. 
measure. So in Europe, where I come from, it's a punitive thing. It's been there for a long time. People change for two reasons. One, because they're forced to, by taxes, or two, because they want to. So taxes is a great way to force change. But you're correct and right in educating. You've got to educate. David's right. You've got to educate people. Ashray, Sibzi. Yeah. We're great bodies of knowledge, and we don't often get asked what we can do. Yeah. And sometimes I'm a very controversial view here is that's because as an industry we don't share very well. Yeah. We're exactly. a kid in the playground with a ball and we don't want to share. Yeah. Because knowledge is all powerful. Yeah. And we've got to teach people it isn't really because it's actually better if you share it. Yeah. yeah. And if we shared what we knew in this room, if I think if we each shared something, by the time I left there I'd be a genius. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were almost kinda of like it's kinda of like Tesla giving away all their, their IP for battery technology. <laughs> right? So that then the whole market moves because everybody learns from that. And Tesla, you know, if their product is better, they're going to win. But everybody starts buying electric vehicles now. That's right. What? Give it all out. Let's start doing this. Let's compete on people playing. Field. Start sharing what we know. Yeah. And we actually, we actually don't know what we know. Yeah. And it's scary. And that, well, that thing with the wall makes me laugh. That doesn't surprise me. Andrew, I'd like to thank you very much for your time, for your enthusiasm and your presentation skills as always have been brilliant. I'd like to thank everybody in the room who came. And I'd also like to point out there's still quite a lot of food there, so if anyone wants to get food. Sorry to the online people, food can't be passed down the line yet, but one day I'm sure spot food technology will come in. Thank you for your time everyone. I know everybody's busy today. And I think it's been really great and I know I've learned something. Thanks, thank you. Thank you all.